Good morning, welcome to Ecourse Community Bible Church. Uh, I'm grateful to see those that are coming to church here at the church, and we also know those who are at home as we're praying for all of you. And those that are tuning in, on, thankfully, on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. And so today we want to uh, open up this study uh, in a word of prayer for we'll bow our heads at this time. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that you have given us the privilege once again on the Lord's Day to come to worship, to come to pray, and now to be able to celebrate by coming together under your word. We pray your Holy Spirit might speak to our hearts and move in our hearts. And help us to be the better for having been here. Bless your word as it goes forward. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, today, you that are watching in can't see our title, but it's called The Pre-Tribulational Rapture. And in my notes, I put it uh, just a little bit different. The Rapture of the Church. Pre-Tribulational? Question mark. Is there going to be a pre-Tribulational Rapture? And we've talked about this. On Wednesdays and last Sunday, this is part two. So uh, it's very important that we don't just take it for granted because someone, is, someone says that there's going to be a pre-tribulational rapture, that that's it. If you've grown up with a certain upbringing in your church and you've just listened to the pastor or maybe your denomination and you think, well, that's all I've ever heard is pre-tribulational rapture. And so I take that viewpoint. Well. We want you at this church to study, to examine the words of God. There are some godly men that believe in a mid-tribulational rapture. There are some godly men that believe in a post-tribulational rapture. We don't believe the word of God because a godly man teaches his viewpoint. We believe the word of God because we examine the word of God. And the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And he'll bring us peace as we study his word. So, our viewpoint today is to discuss the pre-tribulational the pre rapture. Uh, this is our second lesson, so listen carefully. And by the way, if there is a pre-tribulational rapture, and I'm convinced there is, but I'm not saying that that's uh, uh, absolute, not at all. Uh, I, I pray to the Lord every time I come up here and talk about the pre-tribulational rapture. Help us all to discover what your word says by your Holy Spirit. So, if there is a pre-tribulational rapture, are you ready for it? Because Christ is going to come as a thief in the night when he comes. And so, and people will not be aware if they're asleep. And I'm not talking about physically. We're talking about spiritually. Are you prepared spiritually. Do you know that the church of Jesus Christ that's true is looking for Christ to return? And that has been true of the first century Christians. It's the any moment return of Christ. So, um, are you ready for it? And, and, and are you saved? Are you truly saved? Because only true believers, true believers are going up. Alright, today we're going to be looking at some important truths that we introduce today from the scriptures. And these are two foundational truths. These are just a couple of foundational truths in our series that we want to go through what the Bible says that are important. And so we're going to start today by talking about the church is the bride of Christ. Now somebody needs to say, how does that tie in with the, the pre-tribulation rapture you'll see in a couple minutes? Um, and then if we get to it, a second point would be God has two distinct bodies of believers, Israel and the church. What does that have to do with the pre-tribulation rapture? Everything. It's one of the major foundations of why we are pre-tribulation rapture. Those two things, are we the bride of Christ? Does the Bible teach that? And if it does, we're going to see in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7, through nine, that the bride of Christ is right there and they are putting on the robes of righteousness and they are preparing themselves for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what we want to examine briefly. 
And then we come back with Christ at the second coming, at the second stage of the second coming when he comes back. And that's Revelation 19 and verse 14, five verses later from the Bride of Christ. Let's examine that together. Uh, Israel was under the Old Covenant and the church is under the New Covenant. There are two covenants. And that's the Old Covenant. And then you've got the New Covenant. Are we under the Old Covenant? If you've been a Christian for uh, any time at all, you should understand we're under the New Covenant. But you should also understand that the Jews are under the Old Covenant. And we're going to examine that. And Israel has a seven-year period, according to the book of Daniel, chapters, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Listen. Israel has a seven-year period, it's called the 70th week of Daniel, that they have yet to uh, serve to complete God's judgment and restoration of Israel. Judgment, then restoration. That's Israel. It's yet to happen, it hasn't happened, it's been prophesied. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Good to look up these things, isn't it? What does the Bible say? Okay. Um, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 4, let me read that. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. Seal this book. God had given Daniel... Uh, a message concerning prophecy of the last days. What does he tell Daniel? Seal it. So the understanding of the book of Daniel is going to be difficult to understand. In fact, the Holy Spirit is not going to reveal all of this to the hearts of those until the last days. Guess what? We're living in the last days. So what does that mean? That God is going to reveal these things to us and to those who near the end of time. Seal up the book even to the time of the end. How long? Till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall be increased. We could say a lot about that because knowledge is uh, exponentially increasing. It's crazy. We've got uh, Elon Musk talking about uh, by 2024 that taking uh, groups to, the, to Mars and setting up a colony. Uh, we've got AI, artificial and Intelligence, they're talking about singularity, how that they can think themselves and think about thinking. And, uh, well, there's just so much more. People are running to and fro. All of us are running to and fro. We're losing our breath. We can't keep up with it, let alone uh, the multitudes of this world. We're living in those days. And that's Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. So, um, this picture changes in the time of the book of Revelation in chapter 22, 10. The picture is what? That Christ says this. Are you listening? Revelation 22, 10. This is the last chapter of the last book. Watch what he says. And Christ says unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. What did he tell Daniel? Seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Isn't this important? It's important for us to understand this for ourselves. Don't just say, well, the pastor says, or our denomination says, or Dr. Big Brain or Dr. Horseface says. No, what does the scripture say? I'm going to read it. In Revelation 22 and 10, it says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Meaning it can happen any, any time now. You know, the last days began with Christ. We're living in the last days they began with Christ, but we're living at the end, toward the end of the last days now. Now, how do we know the last days began with Christ? Besides that verse, which was probably written around 95 AD by John the Apostle when he was caught up into the heavens and Christ spoke to him through his angel. And we know this from Hebrews 1.1, that we're living in the last days. It began at the time of Christ. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in times past by the fathers to the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. 
used to speak by the angels, used to speak by the prophets. Now Jesus is speaking. And this is, of course, the book of Revelation. So, in the book of Revelation, we see a timeline given for these events. And in Revelation 1.19, Revelation 1.19, it says, write these things which you have seen. He's speaking to John the Apostle. He was at the Isle of Patmos. He was in a uh, criminal institution, an island for his faith, faithfulness to the Word of God. And he's, he's been caught up now to, before the presence of God. And he writes these things. And this is the key verse in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.19, because it explains the whole book. And it also explains to us the time and the age that we're living in and the time and the age of the tribulation and of the millennium and the eternal state. This verse. Revelation 1 and 19 says, Write the things which you have seen. And when this book was written, it was uh, 95 AD. And so he's talking about those things up to that point. And then he says, and the things which are, and by the way, we're living in the time that the things which are. Um, because it's been 2,000 years since the apostles and, and this epistle, this, uh, the book of Revelation was written. And the things which are, are also, those are chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation. And that includes the church age. Specifically, no less than 19 times is the word uh, church or ecclesia mentioned in the first uh, three chapters of the book of uh, Revelation. And then it's not mentioned again, except we see the church in heaven through the 24 elders around the throne, and we'll give you someday seven evidences as why those 24 elders represent the church. And I think they're strong evidences, friend. Then we have, uh, beyond that, uh, we go to the book of Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. We just mentioned when the bride of Christ is getting ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to talk about that. The church appears in chapters 1, 2, and 3, but from chapter 4 through 19. Church is not mentioned on the earth. Are you listening? Go through the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 19. Somebody show me where the church is. Somebody. You say, well, in Revelation chapter 12, I can show you, Pastor. What do you mean in Revelation chapter 12? Well, there's a part there that it speaks about uh, the offspring of the woman that is Israel. Well, wait a minute. If the offspring of Israel uh, is, is, is of the woman, is, is Israel, then that means that those are Jewish offspring. The church is an offspring of Israel. That's what we're going to look at uh, uh, today, uh, probably next time as I'm looking at the clock. Church is not the offspring of Israel. Okay? Um, the, the title woman is used eight times in the book of Revelation chapter 12. And in each context it's dealing with Israel. It doesn't change to the church. And also in that particular passage it shows that Satan is coming back and he's coming after the woman. Where does it say that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 13 through 17. He's coming after the woman. Now, if he's coming after the and her offspring. If it says who keep the commandments and have Jesus as their Savior. Yes, the Jews during the tribulation period will hear the gospel, 144,000 Jews, Jews of the tribe of is tribes of Israel will be saved. Where does it say that, Pastor? Revelation chapter 7, the first eight verses, speaks of the 12 tribe. And then it goes on in Revelation chapter 14, and it speaks about this entity that God has used, who are totally committed, 144,000 Paul the Apostles, to go around the world and preach the gospel. Of the tribes of Israel, where is the church? Where is the church? All right, we're talking about a pre-tribulational rapture, so I think that we're beginning to make arguments from the Word of God, God is enlightening the church that the church has to be someplace. Satan's not coming after the church. He's coming after Israel. Where's the church? We believe that uh, there's the evidence as we go through these series that the church has been raptured. Okay? These are important things to know. And so, uh, 
with regards to what we're looking at here is that uh, uh, the New Testament speaks to the church and gives instruction and guidance and admonition during the church age. We have all of these epistles before the book of Revelation that tells us do this, don't do this, live this way, grow in Christ, be sanctified. But once you get to the book of Revelation, there's no instruction to the church other than the first three chapters where the church age is in chapters two and three. That's the only time we have admonition from Christ. That's important to remember. There are no instructions given to the church, chapters 4 through 19, and I want to say this in the book of Revelation, that the church, which is the Greek term ecclesia, is mentioned no less than 19 times in the first two chapters, but is not mentioned again until Revelation 19, 7 through 9 and 14. And it doesn't say the word ecclesia, but it speaks about the bride of Christ, which we'll get to. Who is the wife? The bride, but not, not the wife yet, but the bride. Okay, and they're waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb, which comes in Revelation 19, 7 through 9. So this is uh, uh, during the tribulation period, the seven-year period, that we do not see them in chapter 4 through 19. All right, um, let's be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. I'm looking at verse uh, uh, 7 here. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19. Who's the wife? The church is the wife. And then in verse 8 it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Is that the Jews? Not the Jews, friends. Where are the Jews? The Jews are on earth. The Jews are going through the 70th week of Daniel. The Jews are going through the time of Jacob's trouble. But here we're reading that the wife of Christ, the, not the wife, the bride of Christ, is preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then it says, and this is important, God gives us these evidences in Scripture in verse 8 of Revelation 19, that she, who? The bride, who? The church, should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Isn't that important that he says that? You'll see how important it is when we get down to verse 14. It's essential that God included this in the scripture. And for those that are listening on in, listen, that are mid-trip, pre-trip, and there are some that are amillennial, aren't looking for a rapture, you know, etc., or believe in the preterist viewpoint that in 70 AD, that uh, Christ came back in the rapture? That doesn't make sense. Came back spiritually. It doesn't make sense, friends. But anyways, please pay attention here. We don't have too much more time to talk about this. She's got, it's the bride of Christ. She's got fine linen, clean and white for the, listen, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Okay? That, that will be wearing the robes of righteousness, the robes of the righteousness of Christ. Okay, can we um, make a point at this time in 2 Corinthians 5.21? 2 Corinthians 5.21, as we're talking about the church, has the righteousness of Christ for their robes. Watch this. He, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, to become our sin, that we might be made the what? Righteousness of God in Christ. Who's got the righteousness of God in Christ? The church. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So, um, now we want to look at, uh, uh, go on so, uh, to verse 14. But the same ones in verse 8 are the ones included in the second coming of Christ. The same ones in verse 8 are the ones included in the second coming of uh, the coming of Christ. And what was verse 8? I'm talking about from Revelation 19. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of Christ, of the saints. These are the same ones that are included in uh, uh, verse 14. Now let me read verse 9 first. He saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is still in context. Where does the marriage supper of the Lamb taking place? Up there in heaven. Where? went towards the end of the tribulation period. Who is it going, who is the bride? The church. 
Okay. In verse 9, he says, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. He's not done. Look at verse 14 of Revelation 19. And the armies of God, which were in heaven, followed him upon horses. And then it identifies some of them. Are you ready? Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Exactly the same words about the bride. Who's coming back? The armies of heaven. That will include the angels. We already know that from other scriptures. But it also includes the bride of Christ. Imagine that. Coming back from heaven to the earth with him at his second coming. We're not on the earth. He's not coming for us. There's not going to be a rapture at that moment. When was the rapture? It had to be before the tribulation period, or it could have been at the mid-tribulation period, or it could have been at the pre-wrath. It can fit the uh, uh, rapture if they're, depending upon which one is true, it's far from this verse, but we know that the bride is in heaven at this point, coming back, and will not be here uh, on earth when Christ comes back for who? Coming back for Israel, coming back for the Jews. Is he going to take them to heaven? No. Is he going to change their bodies like his own body so they'll be glorified? No. They go into the millennium in their bodies and they live life is extended. Uh, and that's Revelation chapter 20 and verses uh, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you just read it. Um, now what about this uh, called the bride? Um, the bride of Christ, we begin here uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Somebody says, well, how do you know it's, uh, the church is the bride? What about Old Testament saints? What about that? Could it be the Old Testament saints plus the, the, the church? Well, this is specifically uh, answers that. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, For I am jealous over you, Paul speaking, with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Who is he speaking? To the believers in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. I'm espousing you to one husband as a chaste wife uh, to as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is uh, speaking these things. A couple more uh, points here because the Bible gives us other evidence that the church is the bride. You know, other people say, oh, you know, uh, Israel became the church and the church, it, you know, and Israel, now the church is, is uh, the, taking the place of Israel. And by the way, are you listening? That's the reform movement. But that's, you know, we, we, we thank you for Martin Luther, we thank you for uh, John uh, Calvin, we thank you for John Boos and Tyndale and all the others, but they had a viewpoint as they were coming out of the Catholic Church. They pulled some of the doctrines of the Catholic Church with them and kept them, and today they keep them, and so they believe that the church is, that Israel has become the church. We are Israel. No, we are spiritual Israel. We have our heritage, spiritual heritage back to Abraham. But Israel has not become the church. All right, I want to say uh, this and get ready to uh, close. I want to give you a couple of verses here real quick. Ephesians 5, 25 through 32, and it's speaking about the bride of Christ and who the bride is. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 32. And this is the church's relationship to Christ. It's all about the underpinning foundation of these verses are dealing with the fact that Christ is the uh, the, the uh, husband to to the, the, the groom that is uh, uh, receiving his bride and his bride is the church. Watch this. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved what? The church. What? You mean our relationship is compared to Christ and the church? What does that mean? That means that the same way that the husbands love their wives, Christ loves the church. Not like just like a, a, a brother or a, like a sister. Like a wife. Okay? And so he says, and he gave himself for it, the church. 
Verse 26, that he might sanctify it. That is, set it apart. Who does he set apart? The church. With the washing of water by the Word. And so by God's Word of God, He convicts our hearts and, and uh, leads us to Himself by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we, we, we get saved, is through the Word of God. Oh. Verse 27, that He, Christ, might present it. Who? This is all about us. Himself, a glorious church. Ecclesia, there. Same word that's used. The first two chapters, 19 times in the book of Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3, but not after chapter four. Not after chapter 3, 4 through 19. Okay, to present himself the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay, that's the church. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 12, which we just read, uh, we heard Paul the Apostle saying that he's presenting the church to Christ as a what, chaste version. Chaste means holy, and so it ties in again in here in the book of uh, Ephesians, verse 27. And then 28 says, So ought men to live to love their wife, just as Christ loves the church. Everything is based... The, the, him loving the church is not based on how that a man loves his wife. A man loves his wife on how that Christ loves the church. And it chooses the relationship of a man and a woman of a of a groom and a bride. This is important. Verse 31, For this cause, and I'm in the book of Ephesians 5, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. He's speaking about the church. Who is the body of Christ? Who makes up Christ's finger and his hands and his eyes? And who makes up the legs? The body of Christ. We are, we are all part and parcel of that. Uh, and so, the same between a husband and a wife. They too become one flesh. Verse 32, and this is my last verse, and I'm closing. Watch this. This is a great ministry, a mystery. There it is. The mystery, the rapture is a mystery. And uh, the, the, the difference between the church and Israel is a mystery. And the difference between... Uh, Christ, um, the difference between um, the marriage of the church to Christ is a mystery. Was it mentioned in the Old Testament? No. Was the church mentioned in the Old Testament? No. It was a mystery. We all know what a mystery is. It's a mystery is something you have to solve. And you get the evidence you solve it. And this was a mystery. All right. And so, uh, this is a mystery between, let me read it, this is a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the ecclesia of the church. Okay? So, all of this passage finds its roots and foundation in Christ's relationship with the church. And so we ask the question, what about Israel? Are they distinct from the church? We said it at the beginning, we'll get into that next week. They are distinct from the church. We didn't become the church. God still has a plan for Israel, the old covenant believers, and his plan for the church is unique and distinct, and it's discovered as we search these scriptures, and, and, and the time of Daniel's 70th week is, listen, not for the church. I guess I should close because I just thought of this. In Revelation chapter 7, somebody says, well, there's the church. No, it doesn't say church. It doesn't say Christian. There's a group of people that will be saved during the tribulation. They're the tribulation saints. And there's a couple of other spots in the book of Revelation that mention the tribulation saints. Isn't it interesting? If it was the church, they'd say the church. It's the tribulation saints. And then we see them in Revelation chapter 20, the first three verses, and how that... Uh, they are they that gave their lives for the witness of Christ, and there they are, and they're going to receive uh, authority during the millennial reign of Christ. Those are the tribulation saints. We'll talk about that next time. Next time, we are going to be looking at the church is distinct from Israel. This is the foundation for a pre-tribulation rapture. We're not just going to quote some verses of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the, the latter verses of that book, and and say, okay, there's the, there's the rapture. 
We want you to understand what the Bible says and the evidence that God gives to us that we have uh, 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 good evidence that we'll go up in the, in the rapture before the tribulation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your scriptures. We pray that you help us to understand not just what a pastor has studied and taught, and not what a, even what a denomination or a movement has thought and taught, but Father, that what your word of God says, and help us to understand, because Jesus Christ tells us, Revelation chapter 22, he says, do not seal the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Help us to give us understanding as we study. We thank you for this pre these precious truths. We ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.